Hello, I'm Eduardo Villaro, the Artistic Director and CEO of Ballet Hispanico, and welcome to the BH History Legacy Experience. I'm so thrilled you could be with us today. So I just want to introduce what we're going to do today is a little different than a watch party. We're going to, it's like, like being with your family in La Cocina. We're going to talk to family members. We're going to share stories where you'll see little clips. Um, but most of all, what we'll be doing is highlighting the incredible legacy of this 50-year-old organization. So let's start and let's think about Tina Ramirez's legacy. Vamos. The extraordinary act of a Latina immigrant embarking on a journey of access to the arts for a community during a time of social and civil strife in New York City is an example of artistic advocacy. When thinking of the years, the families, the students, the artists, and the administrators whose lives Ballet Hispanico changed, one cannot help but wonder in amazement at the power of such a vision. It was this idea of service for a marginalized and silenced community that made Tina Ramirez's founding of Ballet Hispanico unparalleled. It continues to amaze me how Tina developed this voice during this very difficult time in New York City. Because in the 1970, New York City was burning literally and figuratively. Reeling from a decade of social turmoil, New York in the 1970s fell into a deep tailspin provoked by the flight of the white middle class to the suburbs and a nationwide economic recession that hit New York's industrial sector. This white flight left boroughs of New York, which were and still are havens for recent immigrants from Latin America to rot against a background of gangs, drugs, and real estate thugs. Combined with substantial cuts in law enforcement and citywide unemployment, topping 10%, crime and financial crisis became the dominant themes of the decade. Depopulization, depopulization and arson had pronounced effects on the city. Abandoned blocks dotted the landscape and the shells of buildings creating vast areas absent of urban cohesion and life itself. It was during this time that many artists of color emerged as leaders for their communities by establishing nonprofit organizations dedicated to providing access to arts education and survival. On the heels of the civil rights movement, artists of color were ready to stake their rightful place in the arts landscape of New York City. In 1963, Tina's mentor, Lola Bravo, asked Tina Ramirez to take over the operations of her studio as she was retiring. It was something Tina had no interest in, but she did love to teach. Tina accepted the reins of the studio on one condition. It would be only for a year as she had plans to continue performing. What began as a bridge to get her over so many things turned into one of the most important dance organizations for the Latinx community today. I started Ballet Hispanico because I had children that I had been teaching since they were seven years old. They were growing up. They had dreams and they wanted to be artists. And I said, why not? Let's go. 
This is the organization that Tina built, and I am so thrilled because when Tina started, she started with a handful of her students, as she said, and she created this company. And we have um, someone with us today that was at the very beginning. Tina had a lot, before she even started with Lola, she was doing a lot of work in the city with special programs for kids. Um, and she was involved with a program called Operation High Hopes. And here we have Alicia, who's with us here today. Um, Alicia Roque, please join us, who was part of Operation High Hopes. Bienvenida, welcome. Gracias, muchas gracias, un placer. I'm so happy you're with us. Estoy encantado que tú no puedes sab saber. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so, you know, um, I wonder if you can tell us about Operation High Hopes and how you came to Valley Hispanico, because as we were talking backstage, it was not an audition, which is what I had to do. <laughs> exactly. Um, back then, it was like we didn't know what auditions was to begin with anyway, but we just we were hungry for something we wanted to do. I, I especially, because in my family, I was the one that had the dance bug. I saw the on the Ed Sullivan show some Bolshoi ballet, and I told my mom, I want to do that. Oh. And then from there, a friend of my mom's told her there was a program. She said, take all your kids, just go. And that's how we got to join the summer program. And it was a miracle for us because, or for me at least, I don't know about my siblings, but they were happy to do something also. But for me, I, it, I was over the moon. So I got the chance to really try out so many different dance styles and learn to sing and to be out in the streets performing for people. We did the band shell in Central Park and it was phenomenal. And I still have pictures from that. I have personal pictures from all those things that happened. So we, I learned so much in the little time in the summer. Then we went to um, Tina's studio. We continued there and that was the Tina Ramirez School of Dance. And that at the time when I went was on the top of the Ed Sullivan building on the second floor. And wow. we could see the marquee from the window in her studio. Wow. And from, from there we went to 34th Street, from 34th Street, we did performing hospitals, street fairs, street shows, whatever Tina could find, we did it. So we were all over the city at the time from a very young age. And before even I entered, she had other like Sandra Rivera, um, Dolores mm -hmm. Garcia, all those people were in there before me. So they started other shows before us and then we just eventually just got into performing, and then the next thing we knew, we were Ballet Hispanico. It so, was miraculous. Yeah, so, but I mean, you you were learning so much and so quickly, right? And mm -hmm. it was a difficult time, as I, and I, as I mentioned and as I showed, in New York City at that time. I mean, I, I, I arrived with my family in 69, 68 um, and grew up in the Bronx, and I remember how tough New York was oh, at that yeah. time. Um, so, oh so dance God. became a lifeline for me, and it sounds like that happened to you as well. Yeah, we were. I was born in um, the the Grants Projects on 125th Street in Amsterdam. Sure. So from there, my mom put us in Catholic school, then into the summer program, and then <laughs> so she kept us off the street as much as she could, even with the little money, working two jobs. My dad's working. Everybody, you know, was just to make us stay away from the bad stuff that was happening. There were gangs around in our building. So it was really a hard time. And I was oblivious to all that. You know, I would hear little things here and there, but all I know is that I just wanted to dance. And that's it. And then my siblings had to go with me. <laughs> I, I love that because it's this is the power of the arts. And I say this all the time, mm -hmm. and I see it, how the arts can transform and can take a child and remove them from a perspective. You know, we have, we, we talk so much about um, you know, how we are born into things and get stuck in a system. Um, but the arts can really elevate you so much. So you were learning such um, a diverse amount of dance styles. Uh, you want to run through them? Because I think it's remarkable. From um, me dancing around my house and driving everybody crazy, sure. they would all make fun of me. And I was like, I don't care. But um, 
I learned African dance. We learned flamenco. We learned ballet. Um, I think it was Mr. Corvino who you who taught us at that time the ballet. Mr. Corvino. Um, oh. Yeah, and it was uh, oh gosh, um, it was ballet, jazz. We it, it just it just went on and on. And then we we learned to sing, and all the songs, especially the song from High Hopes, the main song. What you know about the little ant that he wanted to move a rubber tree plant. And I was trying to find the words to it, and I couldn't find it anywhere. I said, I remember a little bit of it, but it was phenomenal. We even did from South Pacific, we learned a song. And we had somebody come in and teach us what the hand movements were for that. So <laughs> I, was, I was in heaven. Everybody was, we were having fun. We were staying off the streets. And once we went home, you know, it was continued the next day and the day after and the day. We didn't, I didn't want it to stop. So that's where my mom, my mom also wanted to sing, but she lost her chances and all that stuff. What happens with, you know, when you become a, a wife and all that, then we were born. So she pushed us towards the arts. And she had a friend who had sons who, who also were pushed into the arts, but in the acting field. So we were very close around all that stuff. So everybody that we tried to connect with was art wife. So families that even had guitar players in their family or something. We always had music. We always had dancing, be it salsa, merengue, cha-cha-cha, whatever, you know, party. We, I was dancing. My dad taught me to dance. I was on his feet. So <laughs> I was holding on to him. He taught me to dance. So I just, I just, it, I was so hungry for something. And in my soul, I knew that's what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Um, hence, I've continued on. So, you know what? I have a clip um, of Echoes of Spain, and then maybe we can watch it a little bit, and then we can talk a little bit about that piece and some other works, like your favorite works we want to talk about. All right, so okay. let's see if, if, if our fantastic Kelly will show us that clip. Thank you. What does that bring back? Oh my gosh. And I don't even know if that was me. I have to take a closer look at that again. I'm not going, okay, I remember starting with a different costume. And then I'm not going, okay, that could have been me. Yes. I, <laughs> I'm not sure if it is. Or if it looked like Sandra for a little bit there also. But I don't know. If I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can change. Playbill, but I don't, I don't recall. I thought it was you at first, but okay. But it's funny because I was one of the first girls and Dolores, we would take turns doing that, that dance, but that's not Dolores either. So I don't know if it was done with somebody else first as practice. I don't know. Well, it could be me. Honestly, it could be me. And I'm just like, it's so small. And I'm like going, 
is that really me? <laughs> so this I, piece was, was so interesting to me because Tina started the training because she was a flamenco dancer. So she started with a lot of flamenco, right? Yes, that was yes. like the essence of training in that discipline. And um, to be able to get onto a stage like that from your training must have been so incredible for you um, to, to be in, in stages like the Delacorte, Clark Center. Um, that's uh, just really uh, superb. What, what, was, what was Tina like at that time training you? Because for me, she was really starting something, fusing, because that, that's a solo and then you, you have jazz coming in. Exactly. That's why it's one of it is my number one favorite. Uh -huh. um, first of all, first of all, because I got a solo <laughs> for a few minutes, and um, it was just so exciting to try something so different. Because we had done jazz, a jazz dance that was different. Uh, Theodore, I forget her name, Theodore, some Lee Theodore, and then we did our flamenco that was separate. We even did learn to do a tango at one time. So it. It was amazing to me, and I just ate it all up. I wanted to do it all. It was amazing, an amazing time, and um, for every one of us that were in the company at that time. I mean, to, to get to that point, uh, it's a demanding form, flamenco. Mm -hmm. You know, the it didn't, it didn't feel like it. <laughs> oh, good. That's am that's amazing. <laughs> For us, it was so natural because we had started younger, like I was at, I was 10, 9, 10. And so learning all these things, I do have a picture. Um, I haven't sent it yet, but being on the bandstand from High Hopes, that was our last final performance. And I was on stage, my mom snapped the picture. I believe it was my mom who snapped the picture of me. And Lola Bravo was showing us um, how to, you know, to style. And of course me, I was like, whoa, I was there already. And everybody else was just like, <laughs> and I went, wow, those moments are precious because that's how much I wanted to dance. It just saw it in my face, in my action. And as I said, it took away my shyness completely. Once I was on stage, I was a different person. You know, uh, the first decade that, that you were part of, I'm so always fascinated by how it ushered in a mixture of dances that spoke to Latin American folk form mm -hmm. and our Spanish legacies from um, the Afro-Puerto Riqueño dances like Pacholi, which we were going to yeah. show a little clip, and which is a bomba, and the Mexican deer dance. Um, and then all of a sudden you also had all these stories from... Um, black choreographers that, that came to work and, and other Spanish choreographers that created things like Paco Fernandez did La Boda de, de Luis Alonso. Um, but I think Fiesta, that, Fiesta in Veracruz, and that Fiesta was another Mexican one. That yeah. was all the flowers and oh, forget it. It was, it was amazing. So I have a clip of Pacholi, shall we watch? Yes. Excellent, vamos. <laughs>
I oh, remember no. that's one of the first things I learned when I joined because we were still doing it in 1985. Um, sorry, 86. Uh, <laughs> for for Lec Dems. That was, yeah. it, was a, it was a beautiful way to. Um, I, I mean, that's the thing about Ballet Hispanico for me. It reintroduced me to the Latinx culture, right? To every, to all the the, the different, and, and made me realize that even though I was trying to connect as an immigrant, there were so many more different kinds of ways of being Latino, Spanish, Hispanic, Latinx. Yeah, I mean, it, it was Puerto Ricanos, Cubanos, Dominicanos. It, we were all meshed. When we were there, it, we didn't even, I didn't even know about Latin, you know, that we were Latin. I was just Puerto Rican and my friend was, you know, a different, you know, Cubana. Mm -hmm. it, it was just lovely that we could, there we could become one. And it, it, it opened its arms to everybody, really. That's what it was supposed, it was meant to do and that's what it did exactly. It started with the Hispanics and then little by little we leaked in some others. And, and, and it was just beautiful. Yeah, and it was, and that's the thing. I I love that that the the diversity that we were doing was also on stage. There was everyone could be part of learning what it is to be Latino or Latina. So I I am um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to take another little little break and talk a little bit about uh, a dance that you dance because I'm very interested in in your in your thoughts and how it came up and because you worked and, and helped create dance Creole, right? Yeah, I remember Jeffrey Holder. I was up to his belly. He was so tall, and we were just like amazed. Every time he spoke, everything was so clear. And he was, we were just like, and sometimes we would just go, is he for real? <laughs> it was like, it was all new to us, this man, tall man. We knew him from the 7-Up commercials, and it was just amazing that he was in front of us. We had, I think it's, we don't see lots of movie stars. So when we do, we're kind of like, wow. So it was amazing. It's so many new, new openings for us. Well, let's, let's take a little bit, uh, a little look at it, shall we? So in 1972, Joffrey Holder created what was to become a signature work for the company during its first decade. The work, Dance Creole, um, comes from his life as a Trinidadian. He captured the essences of his Caribbean landscapes in most of his work, and this work was an amalgamation of those island references. The work was a beautiful representation of a Caribbean community gathering um, and celebrating after a hard day's work. And while it spoke to the joy and the festivities, um, I think one of the important things was that it captured the social conundrum of the colonized black and indigenous peoples of the Caribbean islands. The need to assimilate the plantation's owner's ritual of grandeur were and continue to be a legacy for our Latinx diaspora. Um, it was a beautiful work and uh, we still do it on Lectem. So Alicia, thank you so much. Um, You're very welcome. That That is um, so amazing to be able to say I work with Joffrey Holder. So all this work that you've done, how does it how does it manifest today in, in what you do today or in, in how you see life? I, I'm interested in asking that. It's it's gone through every aspect of my life. I've I did dancing in the uh, helping kids in the streets of New York, different programs. And when I moved to California, um, for a while I had a normal job, but then I went back to dance and started teaching in the parks department. Wow. So there I started ballet programs and uh, adult health programs. I was also doing fitness. I was a fitness instructor. So yeah, I had a lot of careers in my life. And so far I'm here now in Minnesota. Right when I was trying to start, the, um, I took up belly dancing because I do have a lot of injuries I have to be careful of. Um, it was the only dance I could still do and my fitness. And when I started that here, COVID hit. So everything was put on hold. So it got, it, it was rough, but I wanted to go back to at least some teaching. 
Yes, I am 63 years young, but still. <laughs> yes. I don't want to stop moving. Uh-uh. No. There's there's no reason to. I mean, I, I, we're we're all still moving. So, I, I want Exactly. I, I I wanted to talk about because you mentioned how you moved from the Ed Sullivan building to 34th Street. And then all of a sudden from 34th Street to finally when Valley Hispanico in 1973 got the carriage houses. What was that like? I mean, to walk into a space that this is our home. It, it was amazing. We had so much space there. It was two studios at the time and I believe they cut it up into two and a half or it was just crazy. And I, it was, so exciting and you know it was kind of old building but we didn't care we just have room to dance we had been going to other studios to practice and keep the school open and but that was ours we it was so shocking for me that it was like a home so we had so many homes from high hopes to the 34th street to you know 84 89th street so it never stopped blowing our minds. Let's put it that we never stopped growing. We were constantly growing and moving forward. It never took us backwards. So Tina just made it possible, like the high hopes you dream, you make it happen. And I always remember her, she was like, give me more, give me more. Here, from here, put your shoulders back, give more. Look me in the eyes, push me with your eyes. Things like that, and it was like so creative of her to just, you know, she just got so excited that we just got drawn in. So it was so much to learn, and yet we, it didn't feel like it. There were moments once we got older, or not, I should say older, because we weren't that much older, but um, once we started growing, that we still, it was like, saw that we respected Tina a lot more because what we came from to where we are there. And I remember coming to visit in New York when the studio had been changed. And then um, I can't remember who took me and said, oh, do you wanna go up to this, the other floor? I was like, there's another floor? And they took me in the elevator. I was, I didn't even notice that the building in the back was yours, the ours at that time. I had been away all this time. And that was amazing to me, just to get that and to see a little bit of a rehearsal going on. Ah, oh my gosh, it brought back so many memories. And I was just so happy that this is what came out of, you know, from what we did, what we helped to combine to do. Because the other ladies, we're always calling each other, talking each other. Before this, I was uh, a few days ago talking to Sandra and we're like, do you remember this? Oh my gosh, do you remember this, this, this? It's it's phenomenal and we'll never forget that. That's ingrained in our hearts and in our soul forever. Well, I can't thank you for the building blocks that you and Sandra and all the, the ladies put together and made possible for all the generations, for my generations, because um, I can't do what I do do without what you have opened the path for. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Very today. welcome. And it was so a pleasure. Te me cuidas and I hope to see you soon. I will. All right. Adios. Adios. So so now we're going to just jump into the second decade um, after Alicia. It, the dancing in New York was buzzing with emerging artists who were experimental and removing themselves from Early modern dance, Ramirez wanted the company to model it similar to a theater rapper company. Um, the spirit to seek storytellers who could work with Latin music and history led to some of Valley Hispanico's most beloved works. In 1983, after major renovations to that, uh, to the building we were just talking um, uh, about, we moved on to the Joyce Theater and its inaugural season in which Ballet Hispanico performed works by choreographers William Whitener and Vicente Nebrada. Nebrada was a dancer and choreographer from Venezuela who began a long and important relationship with Tina and Ballet Hispanico in 1977. I wanna show a clip of Group Portrait, which was a beautiful work that continues to be 
another signature work of the company from that era. I could still feel the movement from learning that. I, this was another of the works that, that the company was doing when I jo joined. And um, to me, it's so important to, to see the work of Vicente because he was one of the um, Latino choreographers working at a time in the ballet world that you just didn't have Latino choreographers. And so he was really one of those pioneers in the ballet world that we are so asking for so much right now. So I hope the ballet world brings back some of his work. I know we will. But I can't talk about this era without my dear friend, Pedro Ruiz, um, who was there uh, a few years before I was. Um, and here he is today with us. Hola, Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Hola, Eduardo. So happy to be here with you. I'm so happy that we are back together again. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh -huh. Something to look at that piece, right? You did it so oh many times. God. Oh my God. Uh, you know, I remember when I joined the company, some of those dancers were still dancing in the company. So like Mary McKenzie, Ari. So I was that, I was, my group was a transition from that generation to the next generation of ballet hispanico but portrait of lady was the first ballet that i learned in 1985. and tell me about that transition what did that look like it was um because the the work was changing right yes i think uh, i would say that 1985 was a, a new beginning a new wave of uh of ballet hispanico um already start coming different type of dancers into the company. Uh, the repertory start even, you know, opening to more, I would say, uh, more choreographers, uh, you know, uh, range of uh, that year, for example, I would say that year I uh, was my first company in the United States. And that year I have the privilege to work with Tali Vidi. So he was creating Recuerdo de Campo Amor uh, Danny Duell was creating also a new piece for the company. Uh, William Warner returned to uh, add a duet for Tito and Timbale, so that duet was done on me and, and Mary McKenzie. Uh, was also Chan Chin was a, a Chinese uh, choreographer uh, uh, that and of course the work of Vicente Nebrada, of course. 
So uh, what you see a bigger range of also styles. A style for me that was like in you know a, a new uh I would say coming from a classical background at that time, coming from you know Cuba, Venezuela, Venezuela, uh, uh New York, Ballet Panico. This gave me a so amazing opportunity to learn and create work on my body, you know, mm -hmm. and learning pieces that were already been being created uh, before. So uh, that was complete for me. Was at the beginning of you know, uh, I would say for the beginning of a, a, a full opportunities as a as a dancer artist. Yes, and and I think that that was the beauty about this time that it was forming the dancers differently, right? We were moving away from from flamenco. I mean, even when I joined uh, a little later after 1985, I there there was there was still a little bit of flamenco, but it was a very strong neoclassical feel that um, Tina was really looking for that very trained dancer that had a very grounded um, uh, performance and quality, which which I think still lives today. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about your choreography a little later um, because we we want to go on. I mean, part of what happened in this era of of um, variety, diversity, right, and and looking and developing dancers was the the very theatrical side, right, um, and, right, and things like cada noche tango. But can I say something? Uh, yes, please. I think it's very important because uh, one thing, Eduardo, that. Um, that Tina was looking at that time was creating who was Ballet Hispanico. Ah. Who is Ballet Hispanico that is not Alvin Ellie? Who is Ballet Hispanico? Because that era, you see in, in the late 1980s, that was an arrival to this country, and in the beginning of the, of the 90s, was a, New York was flourishing with full of companies and different voices of uh, every choreographer used to have, you know, Twyla Thar over here, you know, everybody was, you know, uh, of style. So who was Ballet Hispanico? So uh, I think that uh, one of the things that Tina wanted, uh, I know that we are separate the flamenco, but she still wants us to have, you know, the beautiful port de bras that make Ballet Hispanico different, for example, the Ellie. The Ellie can have their style, you know what I mean? So what is being Ballet Hispanico that is make you know, a little bit different. I remember a beautiful Porter Ross. I remember uh, Patricia McBride for City Valley, principal dancer of City Valley. They used to just come to see rehearsals because they were mesmerized the way we move the open body and the torso with, you know, with the beautiful, uh, the use of, of the epaule and, and arms. Well, arm was very important, uh, you know, for the, the ballet hispanico. Uh, I would say creating a voice of who we are as a company. So who we are as a Latin American company, right? So I think they, as a Latin American, yes, I would say Latin, yeah, of course, Latin American country. Right, but, but, but I think that that's very important because you mentioned Ailey and, and how, how you find your, yourself even as a repertory company. I love what you just said. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 the things, for example, that I was listening to the other conversation, um, um, Latinos, we uh, when we come here with the Latino, that's very important what you say, you know, with the Cubans and Puerto Rican. The same thing, I come from Cuba, and when I came here, I I said, wait, are you Latin? I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Cubano. And the beautiful, the beautiful of of that is the diversity of of uh or diversity of culture that is is merged all together become the Latin culture. Yes. And that makes us, you know, very, very uh, diversity in many different styles. Because oh, Latino, we all mix on many different things. You know, it's not we are not like you know we all have a <coughs> background. Yeah, you know, Spanish or Africans or Chinese or right. Russians. You know, we are in Cuba. We have everything. We have you know all the rainbow of of, the, of color, and that's the beauty. That's the beauty of that. And the, with that, an Indian also, did, and with that got, you know, uh, the culture and, and the identity of each country that make us so wonderful. You talk about tango. No, 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 I, this is great. <laughs> I, I, people hear me all the time. I want to hear other people because this is so important. Thank you. I think that, that moving on what you just said, utilizing certain aspects of each of the forms in Latin America was important. So um, the flamenco gave you something else, but tango 
also gave you something. It gave you a, a different kind of theatricality and groundedness. I have, um, I have you dancing and we're gonna show a little clip of the trio. So All right. stand by and we'll come back and talk about it. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Bring back a lot of memories. Oh, God. Well, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you see, tango was the beginning of even a new step for Ballet Hispanico. Uh, and was such a, and, you know, you were there. It was part of that uh, of that creation, too. And, you know, work with Graciela Daniel was an uh, amazing experience and learning. You know, we were very young and still, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> at that time. And, uh, and, and we was already going to a little more theatrical, you know, and a, a completely different type of work for, at least for me, that I've been doing before. And before. So uh, what's a new growth, you know, as an artist and, and a new steps for Ballet Hispanico was a big hit, you know, for many, 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 many years. Yes, and, and I think what I loved about it was that, well, and I think what the audience loved about it was the authentic representation of the tango of the people, even with its heavy misogyny and fighting and uh, the way women are treated, it is, um, we, we have to look at where we come from and who we are in order to move forward. And so it, it's always so interesting to me, the work that we were doing at that time, because it was layering um, what, what was to come. Right. Um, you know, one of the things I, I need to mention is that there were those dancers like Nancy Turano, who you dance with, and um, Jose Costas, who were pivotal during this time um, of growth yes. and change. Um, yeah. And and we all bonded together mm -hmm. uh, because we we really felt that we were. I'm going to go back to what you said, and thank you for bringing this up. That we mm -hmm. had created the look 
the Valley Hispanico aesthetic. Do you remember that? Absolutely. And it was very important. And that's, you know, uh, for me, right from the beginning, right from the beginning, when I enjoyed Valley Hispanico, I had many opportunities. I was taking classes in other places and they say, well, you don't go to ABT, blah, 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 blah. But I feel inside me there was a, I believe in Valley Hispanico mission. And I thought Valley Hispanico was the perfect place you know, for me to grow as and help, and you know, uh, I help and prove that, that it is possible to have a career in Valle Hispanico. You know, uh, that was uh, I see in some way I, I like to say my legacy, but you know, because I seen that and, and the dancers, the, the longers, you know, the company, and then you don't need to go to another company to become, a, you know, a well-known dancer or dance a career you can have a full career in Ballet Hispanico. And that's, uh, I think that's a, a very important, you know, uh, mission, basically for our generation who start, you really, really to build that company into the next step with the companies right now. Yes, and, and, and that was the thing. And, and if you look back at now, you know, we always used to hear about Ballet Hispanico being a stepping stone or, um, you know, you go here and then you go to somewhere else. We, were so determined to say, no, this is the company. And I, I think it was that that era that really built what I I now see with my dancers. This is about a company of, of stature and, and renown and also an important company for um, the, the current environment. Um, so I have, there were so many things happening. I wanna ask you because this is a lot, tango, um, class neoclassical work, um, contemporary work. What were you doing to support um, all of this different styles um, yourself as a dancer? Let's go to the personal. Here's Pedro at that time. What were you doing? Where were you taking class? Well, at, at regular, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I was, uh, uh, well, if we had to take classes, for example, when we did tango, we, we, we used to go and, and do researches and, and, and do the tango classes and 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 see movies and 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 study you know the type of work that we've been doing that's our generation or the, the new generation our generation <laughs> our <laughs> generation what the generation yes our generation is you go out and really do the work and really explore you know explore opportunity you know take classes and it uh, depend the style of the you know the work that you are doing but um the important thing is that you know that we were open we were open as the artists we were open as the dancers so we welcomed all the all these styles that they, they, they were bringing to us you know you were talk about Vicente Nebrada you know uh Inés de Castro was in doing a coming very close to that uh, yes you know too so that's something is also a story but it's completely different type of story you know and different type of style of, of dance so that give us a, a very uh good a a sense of to be a, a versatile dancer <coughs> Uh, with a strong theatricality, that, that's something that Tina always wanted, and she always wanted each that each of us had a, a a clear identity of who we are as a dancer, you know. Instead, that we all look exactly the same, you know. So each of have have a completely different, you know, uh, character, and that's something that is missing a little bit of today's days. Yeah, and I and I think it's only so everyone should go take Pedro's class because he's going to give you that character. I'm just going to say to any of the young dancers, <laughs> no, they, they know, they know. <laughs> they know. So I want to shift us a little bit and go. We're in the '90s now, right? Um, you know, the, the '90s was a difficult time. the The dance world was devastated by the HIV/AIDS epidemic, taking away many artists and emerging choreographers such as Ulysses Dove, Arnie Zane. Peter Fonseca, Christopher Gillis, um, and we did one of his works, yes. um, uh, uh, Farewell, which was yes. remarkable. Mm -hmm. But I, I wanna talk about this uh, solo and Susan Marshall coming in. She was a choreographer who Tina was following as she emerged in the late 80s uh, in the experimental dance world. Um, her, her work and her aesthetic was completely opposite to the work of the company. Uh, which was dramatic, athletic, technical, but it was none the you know it was I think the dramatic strength of 
the, the male dancers that led her to create solo. The work is made for a male soloist and it, it brought back flamenco and that's why I say it because you had also mentioned how we still use flamenco. It brought back flamenco heel work paired down to its most essential. So I wanna just show a little bit of, um, of the work and then talk a little bit about it, if that's okay with you. Uh, yes, yes. Yes, right. Oh, yeah. How you think about that piece is that it really um, was such a metaphor, you know, for perseverance, for holding on, and for acceptance and total freedom and abandon from the stigma of AIDS at that time. Exactly. I was. I think that she had a one of her dancer die with AIDS. So what's inspired about that? So uh, having that weight in your head, you know what I mean? And the concentration that you have to have to dance that piece really is, was very, very, uh, a piece that is demanding, um, demanding a lot of concentration, demanding a lot of uh, understanding, you know, at the time that we was living, you know, at, uh, in the 90s, when we was losing a lot, a lot of artists and friends with AIDS, and using the metaphors of the water or the flamenco that is something that is bounding, you know, mm -hmm. and the vulnerability or no, that way that is holding your head. It was very, it's very emotional and very difficult, very difficult piece uh, to dance because I never know if that's gonna be stay in my head or no, stay in my head. The light and the ramp was like this. So he's not dancing flat, I was dancing, you know, so, all this is traveling that we were going inside as you know i know a flamenco dancer you know we all study you know flamenco as a style but we are not a flamenco dancer so working into a flamenco as as is, you know that is so demanding in the in technique with that and dealing with all this uh holding this weight on top of you um I think with I mean it's, it was very 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 for me very demanding role to you know to perform and, and very at the same time very uh, satisfied you know uh, role. Yeah, it was so interesting because it was um, uh, you know it it shows what a, a brilliant choreographer Susan is that she came in she didn't she doesn't perform flamenco but she brought it out from um, from you uh, in, in order to create this very dynamic. Um, uh, piece. Yes, it, yes, in these, uh, uh, yes. I, yeah. There was a lot of that you had to give in order for that to happen. Oh, oh, oh absolutely. And the, and the full of concentration that you need to have to perform that solo. Because you start with the ball in your head, in your hands, you know, sitting in the chair and you have, when you need to, as soon as you get that, put that in your head and get up. Oh God, and just praying that that stay there and, you know, and because you get so involved, you get so involved into, you know, and, and the sensibility when you touch, 
you know, the water inside. And it's all because you see during that time, you know, people was, if you have eight, people was looking at you like this. You know what I mean? It was something that it was, it's like you have a disease that people was afraid of, you know, and, and many people was holding all these, uh, you know, emotions inside. So that piece, is, is, I think, is very well done, you know, as a choreographer. It's a great idea. So now I'm going to move us because, I, I mean, let's, let's be clear. Pedro was <laughs> a dancer and, a, and a, a choreographer with Ballet Hispanico for 20 years, right? Those are two very different um, uh, decades and also a lot of change. And I, I'm moving us from the 90s into the new millennia. And into the new millennia, it, you became a choreographer. Yes. Um, how did that happen for you? How that happened? I, you know, in the in the first part of my of my career, I I always want to dance. For me, dance was be always being my passion to be you know to be on the stage and and uh, but little by little, uh, the uh, the choreographer start. Uh, I would say, I start getting the necessity to you know to have my own voice. Although, if I, I tell you something, when I was very little, young in Cuba, I was like, you know, like I would say, like eight years old, and I, when I started my ballet classes, and my uh, I used to have soldiers, you know, I and and I used to play with my soldiers from my my grandmother used to have a garden, and with daisies. I used to cut the daisies. I became my ballerinas. So I used to have <laughs> all my soldiers and my dancers. And I started doing parents right that you know, changing and doing that. So it was Full disclosure. That's not surprising to me. <laughs> so <laughs> you've been choreographing even when you have lunch. Yes. So uh, I, uh, I, there was the opportunity happened when I needed to go to Italy to perform in international gala. And, and at that time, I already performed many of the, the roles that I had at Valle Hispanico duet. So um, I choreographed a duet, Enamorados, if you remember well. And uh, so Tina say she loved it. And she said, why you don't present that at Joyce Soho when the time with Joyce so Soho's uh, a festival? She was preparing me for the next steps. She wanted to throw me as with a small piece and see what happened. And then I remember it, uh, we were in tour in Florida, in in uh, in uh, Florida, in the Broward Center. You remember that we performed, used to perform there. And uh, she said to me, she come, you know, I want to talk to you. And said, I would love for you to do a workshop for the company. So uh, next year and, uh, and so, that was the beginning. And she said, do something that is related with you, something that comes from inside you. And that, I, you know, that was her suggestion to me. And that was the beginning. Wow. Wahira. So we have a clip of Wahira. Let's uh, watch it. Yes.
Amazing. Uh, so beautiful. I love Guajira. Yeah, you know, and 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 it was such. It's it was so you, Pedro, from from me knowing you all these years. Such an amalgamation of who you are as a Cuban man, um, your theatricality, um, your your just excitement about movement and how you capture both folk and classicism in one. I mean, we we could show there's it, there's more dancey parts, but I wanted to show this part because. You know, there's a legacy um, from your time at uh, Ballet Hispanico that led you to this moment. Um, so, so tell us about your inspiration and tell us about um, building this this work. Uh, my when my inspiration uh, for this work uh, is very personal in some way because this has to this go back, you know, to my grandfather where he used to take me to uh, to the countryside of Cuba very early in the morning. And and uh, I and then I I wanted to bring back all the memory of the people working in the field, what is to be in in you know, the mix of the culture, of, of, of the beauty of the of the of the, of the, uh, the countryside that uh, that is very poetic. And and how I can do that was you know uh, it was very difficult for me to start you know looking for ID, for images. A lot of, this this ballet have a lot of beautiful images. You know uh, that section, for example, for me was like uh, uh, the Wahida woman coming sitting on the, on, on top of a, a mule coming from the mountain all the way down, down to the river. You know to what and then uh, at that time was you know also the mix of the Afro Cuban. You know, uh, for a, a, a Afro Cuban culture in Cuba, and in here we uh, we, we I use a lot of the, you know the one of the uh, Afro Cuban goddesses is, is Oshum, the goddess of the fresh water, and so we uh, you see the chanting of Oshum, and you see the border one a uh, uh, bongo waters, and it's, it's that. You know, sensuality that even washing what they were washing the clothes, like the hard work, there is 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 a very poetic behind. And it's, it's I, I, Wahida was a pleasure for me to work. The hard work, you know, it's a celebration of life. And Wahida is a piece that everybody, in some way, any culture can can you know uh, can relate to. And uh, the beginning of the piece, because uh, you know they have a beautiful image. Uh, it's such a growing. Yeah, it's a it's an open it's an open I would say, open imagination or the audience and, and everybody mm -hmm. was coming you know to me people I remember I have some people from South Africa say oh my God this remind me the asterisk when they getting <laughs> you know so everybody so that's great that when you have a piece and so everybody in some way or another related with. Ah, uh, just I can talk to you for hours. Um, because of wealth of knowledge. I have one more question. Um, looking back, did you ever think uh, you were a young dancer in Cuba? Did you ever think, because well, let's tell everybody that you've gone back to Cuba Yes, now. yes. It's right. kind of like yes. a full circle. Ten, 10 years, yes. Already working in Cuba with the Windows Project. So yes, and it's in 2009 I returned and uh, in 2011, created my first piece for Danza Contemporánea of Cuba. Yes, big circle of life. And, yeah. uh, and uh, yes, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, I, I mean, Ballet Hispanico has been my platform, you know, it's been my, my platform to be ready for the next steps, you know, in, in life. And like everything you never know, you know, in life, I started in Cuba, went to Venezuela, in New York, went back to Cuba. You know, you know. So it's it's just very you know beautiful, beautiful. I would say circle of life, and and opportunities, and and a way to give back. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, and and bring all the experience that I have. You know, working in in the United States, back to Cuba, and learning from the Cubans. Back, you know, in the same time because they're very creative. They're wonderful. Yeah. Well, Pedro, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. This was remarkable. Um, and we'll have you back. And, and we can't wait to see the new works that you create for not only Valley Hispanico, but for everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. And keep the legacy going. Yes. Yes. I'm really proud of all the work you're doing for the company. And, uh, 
And you know, the world is so small, you know, now we are in the other side of the track. Yes, now we are on the other side of the track. And, but, you know, uh, it's been uh, a pleasure. I'm very happy, you know, of my, my, my journey at Ballet Hispanico uh, as a dancer. And, and then as a, as a choreographer, uh, those years of uh, 1999, 2000, was a, for me was interesting what, uh, how the, the dancer, uh, life of the dancer, you know, sometimes some, some, some have, you know, great moments in the beginning. And some, sometimes for me, much more, I, I would say, develop my best work in, you know, the like very misstanding, the eyes of the soul, you know, I got my bestie award, I got my first choreography. It was very, you know, uh, flourish from the 90s to the beginning of the 2000s. Uh, so, uh, I'm so happy, you know, that uh, all that work is, is there, you know, for the future generation of dancers to, you know, to take it to the next level. Uh, well, thank you. And we'll see you soon. We're- you, Eduardo. Ciao. Ciao. So we're, we're moving on, we're at the end, we're at this last decade, it's 2009 and Tina decides to step down after 40 years of amazing service. Um, and I took the, the keys to the car and it was an interesting thing for me because um, as I was uh, growing in, and I didn't know that these pictures were gonna be here, I'm so embarrassed right now. Um, as I was growing as a dancer, I didn't know this, but I, I kept going and Tina lit a fire in me. Tina was the first person to recognize me as uh, an educator. And she gave me a program um, with kids working in temporary shelters where I would bring them in, teach them lessons. Um, and and she, she, like Pedro's choreography, she, um, planted the seed for my entrepreneurship, right? So becoming someone in the arts, and that is so important because that's what I think Ballet Hispanico does and will continue to do. I'm going to now bring in a really amazing artist, choreographer, friend um, who came with me to Ballet Hispanico um, back in 2000 and something, I won't give the date. Um, but I want her to join us because we're going to talk about this new era. So, Michelle Manzanales, hi. Do you got that on? Yes, I'm. I'm on. Hi, Eduardo. It's so good to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me to this really important and wonderful legacy talk about Ballet Hispanico. I am so thrilled you're with us because, um, to me, you are the future. Um, as we see, as we pass on. Um, you know, when I first came here, it was really difficult because it was like, how do you take the legacy forward? How do you move it forward? I knew, I knew what I liked and I had so much of Tina in me that you, it is undeniable that I am one of Tina's, um, protégés, uh, in the work. But for me, it was about shifting the, 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 the thinking of diversity. So what is the diversity? It's not only our music and our folklore, but it's also our people that made different things. Um, and so that's why some of the work that I brought in, like Asuka, when I made Asuka, it was about a woman, an Afro-Latina, um, and, you know, glorifying, taking our narratives back. The fabulous Celia Cruz. And like, I love how this evening, there's been so much talk about I love, so Pedro was just talking about how personal Wajira was for him. And, you know, you've heard these personal stories throughout this, this journey tonight. And when I think of Celia Cruz and I think of you, I'm like, whoa, okay. So this is also very personal for you. And I feel like Ballet Hispanico gave that platform. So I'm going to turn it on you really quick oh. because you get to ask all these questions and I've, I've <laughs> done a lot of these talks, but I want to hear about, you know, your connection with Celia Cruz and 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 I feel like that special moment of like this place, Ballet Hispanico, that raised you as a dancer, as an artist, and then as a leader, um, as an artistic director and choreographer and gave you this platform. So I would love to hear a little bit about how special Celia is to you and why you felt this was the moment when you came in 2009, when you were when you were starting this new, this new era, this new chapter for Ballet Hispanico, like, why was it important to tell a story about her and bring that to Ballet Hispanico? Um, uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, 
I, I was interested in, in bringing the different voices and the voice of this woman was a voice that I heard, you know, growing up in the Bronx. It was the way I connected to my culture. Um, she freed me uh, and she, she made me feel like I had a place here because she had a place here. And, you know, she had a story like many Cubans that were extracted from their land and couldn't go back. So there was that, um, there, there, there was that sameness, right? There was that um, uh, sister and brotherhood that, that I shared with that story. And also because this was an Afro-Cuban woman who became the, the salsa queen of the world. She brought people together. She, it wasn't about, I'm a Cuban um, uh, rumbera and singer. It was, I'm a singer that brings my community, like, like Pedro said, Puerto Ricano, Cubano, Mexicano, Ecuatoriano. I bring Latin America together because our music is connected together, even with all the issues we have. With all, there's the beauty because there's always the yin and the yang. Um, and so I wanted to capture that and her music was perfect. So the work was really about the yin and the yang, the, the uh, oppression you feel about staying and leaving uh, uh, Cuba, about um, raising your voice, about also having to um, negate yourself and then accept yourself. Um, so it was really, really powerful for me. So thank you for asking. No, I, I feel that. And I feel like, you know, when you were talking to Pedro and saying, you know, because you know him and that that piece is special for both of you because you know him and you saw it reflected in his choreography. Um, I feel that same way about this piece for you. And and like the images that come up for me when I'm watching it, there's a there's an opening section. I'm not sure if we're going to get to see a little bit of it, but there's an opening section where there's like this very powerful line and there's the, the music choices that you made, the specific songs that you chose um, and even the soundscape. So I would, I'm wondering if you might be willing to share just a little bit more about the personal part of it, the imagery that comes out in the piece that maybe people that haven't heard before. Um, yeah, our audiences. And I think I, I'm seeing that we do have a clip, but I, I will tell you that, um, there was always this, one of the things I do remember is that we had to wait online for food. My mother waited on lines for rations in Cuba. And then um, the lines at the airport. And then there, there was such a power in lines, the lines when you're coming in as an immigrant here in the United States. So there's this, there throughout the whole piece, there's this, the lines and how they restrict you and how they free you. Um, and then that, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll show the first section. The first section is an Afro-Cuban song um, to a, a, a goddess who's syncretized with La Virgen de la Regla, and in, which is a, a saint in Cuba. And so that duality of the Afro culture with this was very important to me. We'll take a look.
so that that was the wrong section, I guess. Um, but but this very similar. So this was her solo towards the end of her real, um, you know, confronting fame and also her past. Um, and the soundscape really is a mixture of uh, I, I did a lot of research and looked into um, live um, moments. Uh, so you hear the talking and then you hear the constant thing. But thank well, you. and that dancer, like that's, you know, that's the beautiful, wonderful Jessica Wyatt. Amazing and, Jessica Wyatt. Uh, I'm, I'm sad we didn't get to see that other solo, but like she's so wonderful in this role and like the way that you, that you brought it to life through her. Um, yeah. It's just really special. But but I'm going to move on because, you know, so so bringing the different voices, one of the things I did was was start an Instituto Coreografico to develop more voices of of Latin of the Latinx diaspora and more female voices. And you uh, did one of our first institutos. Um, do you I want to talk about your experience about that? I would love that. Sure. I mean, I this is one of my favorite things that you brought to Ballet Hispanico was this Instituto Coreografico, so needed in the dance world and the dance field, a place for choreographers to. It's really a laboratory. It's a it's a non product driven, uh, you know, two or three week session with these beautiful the dancers of Ballet Hispanico, and yes. I was fortunate enough to get that um, opportunity to be one of the choreographers in this process. And um, I feel like my time with Ballet Hispanico and everything, you know, you've been talking about these personal pieces, right? It's like, it set me up for this moment uh, to, to say something very personally through my choreography. And uh, through, through the Instituto, I started working on a piece called Con Brazos Abiertos, which eventually, after this, um, you decided to commission and actually bring to fruition and bring to the stage. And it, it, it without Instituto, it wouldn't have been the same because it was during that time that I was given the permission to just experiment and try try ideas and investigate um, this story that had been brewing um, and that that yeah, it birthed <laughs> it birthed this piece, Con Brazos Abiertos. So I loved working with the, uh, uh, doing the Instituto Coreografico and also working with a filmmaker and working, um, just having the support of uh, the entire organization in this process. So it was really special. So I, I'd love to show a, a clip of it and then talk some more with you about, about it. And I have a couple of other questions if that's okay. Of course, of course. Okay, let's show Con Brazos Abiertos. Con brazos abiertos, I bring myself to you. Mírame. I'm her. I'm here. I am. Yo soy el presente, el pasado y todo lo que te espera. Are you listening? Gliding in and out of two worlds that collide and combine and will never fully be mine. Escúchame, estoy aquí con brazos abiertos, without criminality or apologies, without the heat of shame, without chains or borders or green paperwork. Mírame, una madonna bonita, peligrosa, pero sweet, pero linda en mi ropa, beautiful in my skin, a moving mountain, a breathing testament. I am here con brazos abiertos.
Amazing. <laughs> I, I, I'm so great. I'm just really grateful. I, I love the dancers at Ballet Hispanico and. Yeah. You know, when I was watching it, we need to give a big shout out to all the dancers of Ballet Hispanico. Um, they are just remarkable artists and I can't, we, we all can't wait to be back in the studio, but M Michelle, the, the piece is also very personal. So I throw back the, the question that you gave to me. Um, why this piece at this moment and um, in such a personal space? You know, I think um, it was the perfect coming together. Yeah, I had worked with the organization at that point um, for about seven years. And I've had a, a history longer than that with you, Eduardo. I was a dancer for you and your previous company that you founded in Chicago and then and, and had been working. and through our work together, and especially here at Ballet Hispanico, you were talking about this too with the other guests, it unleashed something, it allowed us, it gave us permission and freedom to tap into who we really, who we really are, to investigate that. And that really is why this piece was possible for me to tell and why I felt safe to tell it at Ballet Hispanico because I knew the integrity of the work that was happening and, and really creating a, a platform for Latinx voices like mine that don't fit in a mold, right? So I was telling the story about my own journey of uh, growing up in Texas and South Texas um, as a Mexican American, my, my mother, first generation, she immigrated here when she was six into the United States. My father, second generation, um, my grandfather, his father, a migrant worker, you know, picking in the fields, you know, in Texas and, 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 um, but me growing up at the time of MTV and like, you know, Radiohead and, uh, Cheech and Chong and Selena and all these things. And just being free to tell that story through my favorite language, which is dance and through my medium of, of contemporary dance specifically was just really special. And I, it just felt right. And it and it it was it it was serendipitous, if you will. Oh, I love that. I I think there's there's a lot of beauty in serendipity, and it was it came at the right moment. You know, you were part of an all female program that um, we put together, and um, right at the time where there was a call for more female choreographers and more leadership. How are we doing with that? How do you think we are doing it as the dance field? I think it depends on who we're calling we, <laughs> because I mean, <laughs> you and I have been working together for almost 20 years and you were doing Latina programs 20 years ago. Right. So I think it's for some it's new and, and, and I'm happy about that. I'm so, I'm so happy to see more uh, female voices, um, being given the space to um, to speak, I think there's a lot of work to do. Um, honestly, I, I think you know we all have work to do in that area, uh, but um, especially in dance, uh, you know, there's so many female dancers. There's way more female dancers than males. Sorry, Eduardo. <laughs> there's way more female dancers than males, but there's a lot more males in leadership, and it's just and it's something that people are talking about and people are taking action, and I love that. I love that. Um, that that is happening. And I feel really fortunate that um, I have a leadership position at Ballet Hispanico. Uh, I always, I, I talk about it when I go outside of Ballet Hispanico, it's, I kind of feel like I live in a reverse bubble because the bubble I live in, you know, females are leaders and uh, people of color are leaders. And so it's interesting, but yes, there's a lot of work still to do. Uh, right. in that. There's a lot of work that internally we still have to do, our own cultures, right. our own, I mean, this whole um, shedding of 
uh, who we are as post-colonial, post, you know, and someday post-white supremacy, um, you know, how to remove ourselves when we can be both um, two things, where we can um, uh, still advocate, right, and, and, and do the work, but still be caught in some of the systemic ways we were taught. It's, it's not an easy thing, and it's, it's, a, it's a moment where we all have to come in, um, come in all the time to it. I totally agree with you. I think, you know, we all continue to learn. I know I've learned a lot, and I've changed so much over the last 20 years. I'm not the same person. We, none of us are. But I'm not perfect, and I don't pretend that that Bally Hispanico is perfect. But what I do know is that I love the dialogue and how much I've learned over this time. Um, you know, when you know better, you do better. And uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. Um, what I love uh, is that, you know, I started talking um, and we're almost done everyone. So I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, I can talk with these amazing artists forever. We started with Tina and through the years and her legacy and we're finishing up with you, Michelle, and a legacy of a female leader and moving forward. Um, so we've seen so much come from you and we, we know that there'll be more. I love this kind of field bookend. Um, and go ahead. No, I, 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 I just, I appreciate so much Tina and all of the, you were saying earlier, the foundational blocks and like all the work Think of all the people that have come through Ballet Hispanico. Every single person's contribution has led us to this moment. And it's just like, I, I feel the responsibility, the excitement, uh, the importance of what Ballet Hispanico means to so many. Um, it's such an honor to have leadership in, 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 in something that's so special and um, just important to where we are right now. Yes, yes. Um, because we, the, you know, I, I, like I said earlier with Alicia, you know, to understand that a child is in the midst of drama and trauma, like her and both her and I were um, in our own perspective lives, and that this dance form lifts you and takes you because of the singular act of Tina. I mean, and that, that is incredible. So we can do, we can move mountains. We can um, do this work. And I, I just always want to make sure that everybody understands that the arts can do it. Um, and, and that's why we need it constantly. It has been a pleasure having you. Um, thank you so much for thank everything. You, um, uh, and I, I'll see you around the block, huh? I hope so. Yes, I hope to see you soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, querida. So, Hi. Ballet Hispanico's work over the past 50 years has given visibility to the astounding contribution of our Latinx people. Um, like I said, the simple act of placing our voices on a national and international stages continues to be an act of advocacy. What a gift to be able to nurture artists and create cultural dialogues for all communities. Through the work in Ballet Hispanico school and community programs, the repertory is taken worldwide. Beyond theaters, the dancers bring these works to classrooms, schools, cafeterias, community centers, gymnasiums, migrant communities, nursing homes, and even incarcerated youth. In workshops, we teach the cultural connection of art and contemporary society and enable communities to explore and celebrate the complexity of diverse diaspora. I am so honored that you could join us I look forward to seeing you at our next watch party in the next two weeks. Adios, amigos.